Hi, everybody. I'm Yuan Chen, and I'm a PhD student in my final years. I work with Dave Goldberg. And I'm glad here today to uh, to speak in Ori Colloquium about my own research that I've been doing all these years as a member of Ori. And thank you all for being here. So, yeah. So, um, the primary research focus uh, for me as a PhD student is on the so-called online decision-making problems, especially uh, for those problems that uh, are with uh, rich data, in a rich data setting or in a big data era. So speaking of online decision-making problems, it's uh, actually a widely applied framework that can be used for a lot of problems that we are all interested in, such as uh, those uh, uh, in operations research, operations management, math finance, control, and everywhere, right? Real applications, including uh, dynamic pricing, portfolio management, and uh, all these reinforcement learning tasks, such as the Go game or the autonomous, autonomous driving, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so um, I think online decision making is actually not a new problem. But what is new uh, in this big data era, uh, which makes it a little bit different, uh, uh, I would I would like to talk about it in like two uh, two aspects. First of all, it, it is the benefits that it brings, uh, the big data brings to optimal uh, uh, online decision making, and also the challenges. So first of all, the benefits is actually quite straightforward, right? Obvious benefits. If we have more data about uh, our decision-making task, task, we should be able to build a more realistic model so that we can, in principle, make better decisions about it. Um, but um, simultaneously, we see that there, uh, from the computational um, point of view, the problems also become more complicated because as we're using more data, our model becomes more complicated. So uh, the efforts that it requires for us to find the optimal thing to do, the optimal decision becomes more and more uh, increases skills with uh, you know the com com complicity of the uh, of the model, right? So this is typically known as the curse of dimensionality. This is a traditional name, um, yeah, dating back even to Bauman. Okay, so a research goal uh, for me is simply to uh, try to beat this curse of dimensionality for online decision making problems um, in various settings. Okay, so more specifically, I would be interested in, you know, design fast and uh, provably near optimal algorithms for those kind of tasks. So the first question, first of all, the first question women ask is, is it even doable, right? Can curse of, of dimensionality be, be beaten for, you know, online decision-making tasks? So um, let me first give here uh, in uh, negative results like in general, unfortunately, the answer to this question is no. So here is a tool example, which is a simple online decision-making task. Where you can see it's a deterministic problem, totally deterministic, no randomness. And uh, starting from S0, time zero, you're in some states, which is represented by the roots of this tree. And uh, in each stage, you have two actions that you can pick, either zero or one. You pick one of the actions and it will take you to your new state. And uh, by keep doing so, you get a tree, which we call a binary trajectory tree. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, uh, in this example, right? So um, uh, to make it an online decision-making task, we uh, place actually a unit to reward on one of these leaves, okay? And uh, we force the other uh, rewards to be zero. I mean, so there's only one uh, unit positive reward in one of the leaves the rest of them being zero. Um, because there are one a positive reward, unit reward, so we know that the optimal value of this problem is actually equals to one because the optimal policy can always pick the right action each state to navigate, to follow the right trajectory, which leads you finally to the state where we'll give you the positive reward, the, the reward of uh, value one, right? However, to find any policy that is near optimal or reasonably good, you have to exhaustively uh, search over the space of all leaves here, because missing any one may lead you to the wrong conclusion that the problem is with a value zero, right? So we have to test all of these leaves. So this actually uh, means that the computational work you need to get a reasonably good policy for this simple toy example scales exponentially in capital T, which is the depth of the tree, which is also 
the time horizon of the problem. So this is a, a simple example. Um, and uh, actually what it's, uh, what, what's, what it has is actually a true for a general, in a general setting, uh, in a general sense. What I mean is that it captures the fundamental hardness of the reinforcement learning or online decision making problem in general. So there is literally a lower uh, bound or an impossibility results proved by, I believe, by Kearns and also Kakade uh, saying that to achieve any reasonably good policy for general IL, you have to require. Uh, the, uh, the computational effort scale, scaling exponentially in time horizon. So this is like a negative result saying that in general, it's impossible to beat this curse of dimensionality. Okay. So what, what can we hope for, right? What can we do here? Of course, we have to impose certain additional assumptions here. Um, so in the existing RL or, or operations management literature, there are typically two uh, directions that you impose these additional assumptions. One of them is to try to make the underlying model simpler. Uh, what I mean uh, is that you can assume that the model, the probable, the transition probability, all these kind of things are having some simpler, uh, low dimensional, low rank structure, uh, so that you're trying to uh, do some dimension reduction uh, to to make the problem simpler. And uh, some uh, new uh, some new results, including those uh, asking for some fancier uh, uh, lower com uh, lower, I would say, uh, complexity measures such as low Bellman rank or low louder dimension, et cetera, et cetera. So under these simplified uh, uh, assumptions, can, one can show that the sample efficient learning of the online decision-making task is possible. Um, also, there are other uh, papers, uh, actually they assume that, okay, the problem is with some simpler underlying state transition, such as um, you have some ID things or you know, Markov things. This also helps simplify the problem and make it possible to, to learn problem, okay? So our take is a bit different from all these existing approaches in that what we do here is to uh, look at problems which have a, a so the so-called interdependence structure or the combinatorial structures between our decisions. Uh, a typical example is optimal stopping, right? So if, you, if we think back on this, uh, this binary trajectory tree example, we see that in each state, we can freely choose either zero or one. So, so that although we only have like two actions in each state, it seems simple, but the possible policies that you might have scales exponentially you know, in the time horizon, because in each time step, you have two actions to pick. But when there are certain combinatorial structures that we impose, is, uh, for example, for optimal stopping, it uh, actually requires that for each trajectory, you have you make only one choice of stop at some somewhere. So that translates back to that trajectory, trajectory tree example. It will mean that along each trajectory, you can only pick one action one at some time point and then no others, okay? So this, as, as we can see, helps simplify our problem by restricting the policy space. So we don't have that rich policy spaces and uh, probably we can hope for some better, uh, you know, uh, so the existence of the algorithm that can be the curse of, the curse of dimensionality. Um, other examples, including, uh, you know, all these online versions of these combinatorial uh, offline problems, such as online max weight independent sets, you can think of any of them, online packing, online matching, et cetera, et cetera. They have something in common is that they all, you know, impose combinatorial structures on the, you know, the problem and the look at this online version of that problem. And uh, yeah, so uh, one thing that I want to stress here is that um, imposing this comb combinatorial st structure actually does, does not trivialize our problem. Namely, the optimal stopping problem is still a challenging problem in high dimension. The high dimensional optimal stopping is by itself a challenging problem computationally. It still suffers from curse of dimensionality. So it's still a meaningful problem to look at. And uh, what we do, uh, our contribution is to show that um, actually we provide efficient, both efficient and provably near optimal algorithms for those online decision making tasks under certain combinatorial structures, which include optimal stopping and also the online bipartite max weight independent set. So this shows that although in general, the problem is impossible, but under certain combinatorial structures, we can hope for some you know, positive results. 
and I, I will give you the algorithm that's a cheap so okay. right so um, so the, the the plan for today's talk uh, I would I would like to first talk about my work on optimal stopping and if I have time I guess I move on to, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about online bipartite max weight independent set uh, okay let's get into optimal stopping still a brief uh, introduction of this problem. This is a, a very important special case of online decision making with a wide applications where, where the, the most important application probably is high dimensional American option pricing. Okay. And uh, we know that this is a, a well this is a well studied problem. It's very challenging when it's in high dimension. It suffers from curse of dimensionality. Well, let me be specific. What I mean by curse of dimensionality here is actually you use DP dynamic programming to solve these kind of problems. But in high dimension, uh, typically you have a prohibitively large state space. So DP plus a large state space will render your problem intractable. So this is what I mean by you know computationally challenge or curse of dimensionality. Um, the existing approaches for this specific problem of optimal stopping. Uh, they um, mainly focus on, I would say, the heuristics or focusing on efficiency. They're trying to design something that can be, uh, can, some algorithm that can be run in a reasonable amount of time. And uh, so typical examples including approximate DP, so ADP methods, and uh, a lot of simulation-based algorithms. Also duality-based algorithms, and uh, those are based on PDE and deep neural networks. So as I said, because they're mostly heuristics, so typically they lack a strong theoretical performance guarantee. And so there are usually weak bounds or even no bound on both the complexity and the approximation error. You cannot hope for the best of two worlds if you use one of these algorithms. Okay. So what we do here is that, uh, as I said, we uh, actually, achieve, I, I would present an algorithm that achieved the best of the both worlds. I give you an algorithm that is efficient and with a, a strong provable performance guarantee. So uh, more specifically, I will first show you a new representation of the optimal value of the optimal stopping problem. And this representation, this formula is in the form of an infinite sum of a bunch of expectations, as we'll see later. And uh, what is even better about this represent representation is that it has certain convergence, the rate of convergence guarantee. Namely, if I truncate this sum after some terms, like k terms, I can get an error which is bounded by one over k. So it's uh, sort of a linear uh, rate of convergence that we can hope for from this uh, representation. And then, because it's a sum of a bunch of expectations, so it, it's actually uh, can be approximated by Monte Carlo simulations. So each term of this, uh, the formula can be simul is simulatable. So combining these two facts, we get a natural simulation-based efficient algorithm, algorithms, which can achieve the following. I can get an epsilon optimal uh, value and an epsilon optimal policy, which, uh, which in this case is a stopping rule, uh, by running the algorithm and taking a number of samples uh, scales only polynomially uh, on time horizon, capital T. Uh, uh, as we can see here, the epsilon actually appears in exponent, but uh, it does not uh, factor the fact that we get a polynomial uh, bound uh, on the runtime. Okay? So this should be in contrast with uh, what I show in the impossibility results that we cannot hope for anything better than exponential in T. So that shows that in optimal stopping, we can help us hope for something better. Okay. Right. And if I had time, I'll show you that actually this algorithm has some very interesting connections uh, to the network flow, uh, which actually uh, will prove that optimal stopping is in some sense in, uh, equivalent to max flow and main cut problems on a massive tree. And this will lead to a potentially a new a set of algorithms for problems of this kind and uh, more other, um, other online decision making problems with combinatorial structures. Okay. All right. Um, I guess in the, I still have like 10 minutes. Let me get into some of the details of this optimal stopping uh, 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 problems, uh, the algorithm that I promised you. Let me, yeah. 
uh, let me first set up our problem that we look at. So we look at this discrete time optimal stopping problem with a finite horizon, which is capital T. So our problem um, have a so-called underlying stochastic process or the underlying information. Um, like in the option pricing setting, you can think of this stochastic process as uh, the underlying asset that your option is written on. Okay, so this is so-called information uh, process. So we allow it to be high dimensional and allow it to depend uh, the distribution uh, or the transition to be dependent on its own history. So it's path dependent or history dependent. It can be non-ideal or non-Markovian. So our decision is simply, uh, we have to decide whether we want to stop uh, based on our history observation of X1 all the way to XT. Okay, this is what we want to do in each time period. Now, if we decide to stop, that will incur a cost or reward, which is itself a function from the history observation to some real number. All right. And then our problem is to find the best stopping time under which uh, the expected cost is minimized or the expected reward is maximized. Okay. So this is the optimal stopping problem that we've been looking at. So in the stock, to simplify uh, our discussion, I will restrict to the settings where we only consider the minimization problem. And also I assume that our cost function is bounded between zero and one, almost surely. And I, I would like to stress that uh, beyond these two assumptions, I don't have any structure assumptions on the underlying distribution or the structure of the reward function. So it's totally arbitrary, okay? Great. So, all right, let me first show you how we, uh, what is our new formula, how we derive it. So as we see the optimal value, the optimal problem, optimal stopping problem is this, as I give it, uh, as given here, right? So first, uh, there is a trivial lower bound that must hold uh, in that uh, your, no matter what you do, you can never beat, I mean, the best in the hindsight, right? So the expected pathwise uh, a minimization is something that you can never uh, beat because you don't have the future information, okay? So we, we managed to turn this inequality, this lower bound into inequality by saying that the optimal value actually equals this lower bound term plus an extra term. As we can see here, what appears here is another optimal stopping problem. What we do is to take out a martingale, which is uh, the dual martingale of the mean of the y's and it compensates by this e of me. So this is true precisely because optional, optional stopping dupes optional stopping theorem. We take out a uh, martingale. So this is the expectation of a martingale uh, at some stopping time. That should be compensated by the expectation of the martingale at time zero, which is e of me. So once we have this, uh, what follows should be straightforward. We define y0 and y1 to be uh, the two terms up there uh, respectively, and we can rewrite it as the optimal value equals e of mean of y0 plus a new optimal stopping problem associated with the process y1. Okay. Now, we simply repeat this, uh, what we do to the original process by defining uh, you know, a new process y of two, which is y1 minus the associated martingales. Now it's defined to be e of me of y1. You see that we're mimicking what we've, we've been doing up there. And we can write this new optimal stopping problem in blue into these two terms, which is e of me of y1 plus yet another optimal stopping problem. Okay. Okay. And we simply recurse uh, uh, on that idea repeatedly define y of k plus one to be y of k minus e of me and y of k plus uh, given ft, this is the kth martingale. If we keep doing that, we get an infinite sum, right? Our optimal value actually equals the sum of k from zero to infinity, e of me of y of k plus a, a limiting term. And we can prove that this limiting term actually vanishes. And this is what we hope for and what we want. And we end up with this new formula for the optimal value, which is the sum of a bunch of terms where each of uh, these terms is the expectation of the case process that we have defined up there. So it can be a little bit abstract, but let me give you the first several terms in this uh, expand, uh, expansion or the representation. 
First term is the E of mean of Y's. The second term, E of mean of Y minus the martingale. Okay. The third term, even more complicated. But as we can see, because they're all expectations, so, I mean, we can imagine that there is a way to use Monte Carlo simulation to approximate it. Although, indeed, it's true that uh, as K gets larger, later terms will be more and more difficult to, to approximate in, in a sense. The good news is that we don't need to go that far. We only need a few terms, the first several terms, which is guaranteed by the next result, is that uh, we show that for any optimal stopping problems uh, with our cost uh, bounded between zero and one, if we truncate after nth term of this expansion, we can prove that uh, what we get is uh, an one over n approximation of the true optimal value. So this gave us, gives us the, uh, the, the rate of convergence of this uh, expansion. So, so then the, actually it yields a very natural simulation-based algorithm. We simply take out the first n terms you know, in the expansion and then we use Monte Carlo simulation to approximate each of them. And uh, then we just simply add them up. Okay? So because there is this guarantee and uh, there is certain uh, Monte Carlo, there, there are certain guarantees based on probably, uh, do, uh, I would say, Hoffman's lemma uh, and the other uh, concentration inequalities, we can hope for some provable guarantee that our, our algorithm can achieve. Okay. So yeah, so this algorithm can uh, indeed achieve an approximation, uh, which is an epsilon uh, approximation with a high probability in a runtime, which depends only polynomially in the time horizon, capital T. Okay. And uh, it also gives us a randomized epsilon optimal stopping rule, uh, time permitting. I, I guess I will not talk about it here now, but it's all uh, presented clearly in the paper. So we both have the optimal value and the optimal uh, policy approximately. Okay. Um, so I guess I really only have two minutes here. So um, I guess, Probably I just skip this part. This is basically saying that optimal stopping, in some sense, can be viewed as the max max flow and the main cut problem on a massive tree network, okay? where optimal stopping is equivalent to main cuts, and uh, its dual problem is, is equivalent to max flow. And uh, the algorithm I just showed you is, in some sense, a flow pushing algorithm on a massive tree, where each term in this uh, representation can be viewed as uh, the the uh, like the nth term is the the amount of flow that you push in the nth period. Uh, so you just keep iterating this algorithm. In, in the end, you will get the max flow. That's something of that flavor. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So this part is but about how to generalize what I just showed you to a more complicated problem of online max weight independent sets where we prove that for a bipartite graph with bounded degree, uh, the online uh, decision-making problem associated with it, which solves the max weight independent set problem, can be efficiently solved uh, using the optimal stopping results as a subroutine, which uh, gives uh, something like this, which have a similar uh, approx approximation guarantee and a similar uh, runtime approximation, uh, run runtime guarantee. Okay, so, okay, let me really conclude what I showed you here. So, um, so yeah, it's about computationally tractable data-driven online decision-making that I'm interested in and I've been working on for the past three years and uh, particularly interested in the problems with the combinatorial structure because problems with no structure is just too hard and uh, it's just uh, hopeless to solve. And uh, what I show that it's possible to have positive results are uh, those problems, including optimal stopping, the problems of online max weighted independent sets uh, under uh, this special bipartite graph in a bounded, bounded degree uh, setting. So, and uh, for future work, we hope for design of the faster and more practical algorithms, uh, even in the, in the case of optimal stopping. Actually, this is what I'm currently working on. So there actually exists some provably faster recursive methods, which is faster than what I have shown you. Okay. And, uh, and we also hope that it works better in, in practice. And also trying to uh, use more tools from other fields such as combinatorial and continuous optimization to see whether there's an interplay between these tools and uh, the problems that we are interested in. Can they be used to design a faster algorithms? 
and also, um, you know, this problem of uh, uh, problem specific sample complexity lower bounds. We know that in general, it, the sample complexity lower bounds is exponential. But what about if you just look at the problem optim optimal stopping? How many samples do you need to uh, to uh, to learn an epsilon op uh, optimal uh, solution? And I give you an upper bound. I give you an algorithm. But what is the lower bound there? And also, yeah, this, this question can be also asked for other online uh, combinatorial optimal uh, uh, optimization problems. Right? So ultimately, it all boils down to the the huge the big problem of when is online decision making tractable. So I guess I will keep uh, continue working on this and see uh, more interesting results out of it. Okay. With all these, I guess I will conclude my talk here. And uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, you. So uh, I want to open it up for five minutes for questions. I think I saw you, Dong, at first, but I'm not sure if you still have a question. Yeah, just a quick question on the tree example. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <clears throat> so the complexity is linear in the number of nodes. And if yes. I think of the number of nodes as the dimension, then it would be linear. So what's the right? I guess the notion of dimension is the horizon. Yes, yes, yes. So I would say that um, the curse of dimensionality is actually is really a traditional notion. And uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So what really matters is actually the size of the state space. So as we can see in this case, the state space, the number of states, uh, scales exponentially uh, in the time horizon. So you you really have a a, a massive number of states in the end, and that's. Uh, that's what I, I, actually that's what screwed you, and uh, the dimension is not actually a decisive ma matter here. And also, uh, yeah, dimension is not a decisive factor. And also, in I mean, literally in this optimal stopping uh, example, as uh, the optimal stopping problem, the state space dimension of it because the state space is it's it's is itself literally uh, it can be continuous. So it's actually you can have infinite number of states. So the dimension is really, yeah, really not, it's, it does not show up even in my uh, algorithm in the end. Uh, it's implicitly uh, absorbed somewhere in the sample complexity. It's uh, the this complexity of uh, generates each sample. Uh, th that's where the dimension appears. So in a bound, that's really depend on only the time horizon. Yeah. I see. Thank you. And next is Jamal. Yeah, I had a question about the the optimal stopping. Um, can you also compute the the sort of quote unquote Greeks um, of option prices with the same kind of error bounds? Or are those? Um, um, uh, yeah, as long as the Greeks can be interpreted as uh, you know a function on the trajectory of the, as I see here, the trajectory of the, the underlying information, which is the prices of an underlying assets, as long as the Greeks can be represented as something like this. So then in theory, we can, the, the algorithm can, 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 can compute this. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. Say Oh, sorry. Did somebody have a question, Jim? Yeah, you, you don't. Uh, 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 you line. That's uh, the policy. Uh, you didn't get into the policy. Did you presumably? Uh, is that you using? You first get a value function, then from the value function get some sort of greedy policy from value function, or what's the strategy? Yeah, this is a very natural thought. Um, as we can see that for a general RL problem, this probably is not the right thing to do because there is certain exploding issue. Even if your value function is small, the, the, the greedy uh, algorithm, uh, uh, the greedy policy associated to a, an epsilon optimal value approximation may not be itself a good policy. But this is not true for optimal stopping. For optimal stopping, actually, you can use what you just said. That heuristic works here. So I see that's uh, that's indeed uh, that's uh, that you used right that's uh, the um yeah this used, is part you, one part two I would say that this is actually not what I use um, I'm using something even more subtle there uh, it, this is this should be related to the um, the special property of the result that we find 
So what we find is something which is stronger than merely a value. We find uh, some, some sample path, strong uh, solution in some sense. Mm. Okay, so, I'll get you into the paper. That's, that's yeah. good. Okay, yeah. good. So yeah. Thanks. Uh, take the rest of the questions offline, but thank uh, you, Lena, again. All right, quick clap. Uh, so next up is Ben Grimmer. Uh, I don't know if you can share your screen, Ben. Yes, let me do the two minutes of setup. Two seconds. Okay. Uh, and uh, just aim for about 5.13 to have five minutes for questions. Great. Uh, are my slides sharing? Yes. Perfect. Uh, great. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be talking today about some results in Minimax optimization. Uh, this is work that I did while at Google Research uh, last spring. Uh, I did an internship there. Uh, and so you know, that kind of is where it started, but there's lots of continuing lines going forward on really interesting stuff that hopefully I can sketch. Uh, a extended version of these slides, you know, the ones for my job talk, are available on my website. So you know you can go look at those if you want to you know, go back and see something I said a few minutes ago, as well as they have longer footnotes that give full citations. You know, if you want to go look something up later, uh, but those are available out there. Uh, the clicker needs to be turned on. Uh, so the overall outline uh, for what I want to cover. Uh, we're thinking about minimax optimization, where we have some variables x that we're minimizing over and other variables y that we're maximizing over. Uh, it's a really classic kind of structure in game theory or robust optimization. Uh, but in recent years, it's become really important in machine learning, uh, doing neural network training and things like that. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the new places where machine learning is showing up. And particularly, these new applications are non-convex and non-concave which really breaks all the classic theory that we have about minimax optimization. Uh, and so you know, I'll wrap up the talk by showing how we can still understand our classic algorithms in this very non-classic setting. Uh, I believe I've trimmed things down correctly to fit in 25 minutes. And I'm happy having questions anywhere in that block. Uh, so you know, feel free to unmute and, and ask something if you want or just wait till the end. Uh, but otherwise, let's dive into it. Uh, and so first, I want to look at a few machine learning problems that fit this general form of just you know, minimizing and maximizing a generic function L of xy. Uh, and particularly, I'm going to think about robust training, so getting more stable uh, you know, adversarially resistant solutions out of machine learning and generative adversarial nets. Uh, I've cut my example doing reinforcement learning, but that can also be phrased as a, a nice minimax problem. Uh, but maybe the most classic setting for machine learning uh, is that we have some feature vector u uh, and a label on it v. So maybe that's a picture, uh, you know, here a picture of a panda. Uh, and we want to train a model, maybe x is the parameters in a neural network, so that we assign high confidence to the correct labels. So across our data set, we want you know, to correctly identify this as the panda uh, and come up with the best model for doing that. Uh, but there's a problem with you know, the types of training we do, uh, which was pointed out by Goodfellow working with Google Research. Uh, and what, what they found was that our models come out incredibly sensitive. So if you take an image and you just add a small perturbation, so here this perturbation is times 0 0.007, that corresponds to flipping one bit, if you just flip some of the bits on each pixel, uh, then you can make a, a network believe with very high confidence something wrong, you know, that this is a picture of a given. Or you can do this in other applications. If I, if I put some stickers on a stop sign, can I convince your self-driving car that it's a speed limit sign? Uh, you know, that would be very bad. Uh, and so we, we want our optimization for these learning tasks to be more robust. Uh, and one common approach that a number of groups are working on uh, comes from explicitly modeling an adversary in our objective. So instead of just directly trying to minimize the loss, we could think about some set of corruptions we're worried about, either these small bit flippings or putting stickers. Uh, and then we want the best model given that an adversary is going to be uh, messing with the instances we see. 
And so, you know, that gives us a, a natural minimax problem uh, where we're training these networks. Uh, another place where minimax optimization shows up is in generative adversarial nets. So a, a common setting is that we have data uh, kind of plentifully from some distribution, but we might want to generate new data from that distribution. So you know, the overused data set is this MNIST data of handwritten digits. So we know what handwritten digits look like. We should be able to have our computer produce new handwritten digits. The way we do that is by training two neural networks. So G is a network that is supposed to take in noise data from this latent distribution and produce new samples from the distribution. And D is a discriminator network that wants to assign high values in this first term to the true data and low scores to the fake data. So we play out this game between the two networks as we train them. And overall, it ends up training to give very realistic samples from our target distribution. So all of the digits that I've included here are uh, fake digits. Uh, so those are computer generated. Uh, you can come up with other fun applications. You, know, you can take the works of Van Gogh and people have made these networks so that you can produce new works. Uh, lots of interesting things come out of these. Uh, so in thinking about these minimax optimization problems, uh, there are two different intuitions that you, know, you can reasonably take when talking about them. Uh, you could think of this as being a sequential game where first the X player will declare their strategy and then the Y player seeing that strategy you know, makes their choice. So it's min and then max. Uh, Alternatively, you could think about this as being a simultaneous game. X and Y are doing a zero sum competition, uh, competing over this objective. Uh, but luckily for convex concave objectives, these are the same. You know, that's the very famous minimax theorem uh, with some regularity condition. There are lots of ways to formalize that, but usually min max, you can switch it and get max min. So simultaneous games are also the same. That's in between those two. Uh, and so, you know, we can use either intuition and it's fine. Uh, but the problems we care about are not convex and concave. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have to be careful about what we're talking about. Uh, and for the examples I'm looking at, I think the more natural way to go is to think of this as a simultaneous game, since we're going to train our GAN by optimizing both networks at the same time. You know, we're not fully solving one network before going to the other. So it's more like we're playing out a simultaneous game. Uh, but there, there's good work to be done understanding both perspectives here. Uh, and so the, the existing theory is pretty limited for handling non-convexities in minimax problems. So you know, one thing you could do is, well, if we can globally solve, which I've already told you we're not gonna do, and so you know, this is, uh, I'm not happy with the state of the art being to globally solve out over the Y variable, but if we do that, then we'd have a minimization problem over whatever that minimization gives us, some function phi of x. And we could then do minimization on that more complicated phi of x function with a black box evaluating it. Uh, or if, if we want to really be non-convex and non-concave where we can't globally solve, uh, then the existing results are primarily making some strong global assumption that allows us to globally converge to some point. Uh, so that's assuming some kind of variational inequality or similar condition that gives us a globally attractive point. Uh, but I'm, I'm not too happy with those either because having a globally attractive point doesn't really sound non-convex to me. So I, I want local solutions to be kind of something possible in front of us. Uh, and so yeah, that's, that's also rather limited. But it, since, since there's not really strong results in this setting, there must be something hard happening behind the scenes. You know, so why is non-convex, non-concave so hard? And you know, the, we can get at that with a really simple example. So here I've, I've drawn out kind of the simplest non-convex, non-concave objective I can. So it's symmetric between X and Y. What the X player is doing is trying to minimize this W-shaped polynomial. And they interact with the Y player just through this uh, bilinear term X times Y you know, with size A. So uh, they have a simple interaction and just minimizing on a W. The Y player is maximizing this M-shaped polynomial, same thing upside down, with the same way that they interact. So if both players play at the origin, the objectives look like this, but either player could improve their position by moving either direction. So if I move the X player over to be around two, that would make them happy. 
So now the, the X player is now in this minima, they're very happy, but that skews the objective for the Y player. So of course the Y player would also now very much wanna move over to take a positive value. But if I move the Y player over to two, that skews the X player's objective. You know, so now the X player wants to go be negative. I'll move them to minus two, and we see the problem is, is showing up. Uh, so for this example, there is no Nash equilibrium to this game. Uh, there, there's no stable place you can put X and Y where both players are happy. Uh, so the, sometimes there's not an answer. You know, and that's, that's pretty sad compared to say minimization where you can always move downhill. You know, there's kind of a natural Lyapunov that will help us. Here we can run in circles. And so I've, I've animated running a very simple algorithm, the proximal point method on exactly this polynomial setup. So with four different initializations, they all fall into this same cycle and then they'll run forever. So no matter what stopping condition we put on our algorithm, you know, we're never gonna see the gradient get small. It'll just keep running forever. Uh, so, so this is pretty hard. Uh, and you know, I, I, I need to deal with this hardness, but the existing theory doesn't let me do it. So I don't wanna globally solve over one of our problems. You know, that's globally training a neural network. And I don't wanna make these global kind of assumptions because that rules out local solutions. And that also rules out the kind of cycling we're seeing, which and it, it's, it's nice to rule that out, but it was a very benign example, just, just some polynomials with, uh, with small coefficients. And so I don't wanna to have to rule out such benign examples from my theory. Uh, so, you know, we need to get around this. And the main question we're targeting then uh, is figuring out when our algorithmic tools do converge uh, despite non-convexity and non-concavity. Because right? there, there are bad things out there. I won't be able to give a, a full result saying, here's how we always solve it. Uh, and so the key observation, you know, and here I'm uh, just talking about this one example for the moment, uh, but the key observation there is to look at the amount of interaction between our two players. So if I set the interaction very low, so this A equals one was how the two players interact, uh, then both players can play kind of plus or minus two, and there's not enough skewing happening from the interaction to make them leave that solution. So if there's not much interaction between the players, we're fine. The middle picture is exactly what we were just looking at. If there's a moderate amount of interaction, we can fall into this cycle. And then the third picture here, when I first saw it, I didn't have an explanation. Uh, and so hopefully soon you will all have a good explanation. But uh, if the interaction gets large enough, all of a sudden we're somehow saved from this cycling and the method will globally converge into the origin. So something very special happens as we get more interaction uh, and and really the main result of this talk uh, is that this is a generic picture that I'm painting. So although we were just motivated by this one example, for a generic minimax problem, the convergence is controlled by looking at the interaction between the two players, where more generally it's not this A matrix, but it's the off diagonal part of our Hessian. So it's the derivatives with X and Y. So if we look at that off diagonal block, that tells us which of these three pictures we're in. If that off diagonal block is small enough and Lipschitz enough, then we'll have local solutions. If it's kind of of comparable size to the diagonal entries, then we can have cycling show up. But if the off diagonal is able to dominate the negative curvature you know, from our non-convexity in X and dominate the positive, the positive curvature that's making our Y non-concave, then we get this global convergence showing up. And so really the right thing to look at is this interaction part of the Hessian. Uh, but that's kind of the main picture I'm trying to paint here. Uh, so uh, I wanna formalize this landscape some. So I've gone and animated the transitions that we were seeing in those three pictures as I move A from like one to 50. So early on when A is small, which it's about to reset, we have four different solutions. And then eventually they merge into one cycle and that cycle persists for a while, but as there's more interaction, the cycle gets smaller and contracts, and eventually it becomes a single point. And then for everything after that, we have global convergence down to that point. So, you know, that's, there's kind of a smooth transitioning between these different phases uh, that we can see. Uh, and so the, the particular kind of problem 
where we can give these three regimes uh, is looking at unconstrained minimax optimization uh, with a twice differentiable objective. Uh, I need twice differentiable just so that I can point to the off diagonal part of the Hessian and call that you know, the amount of interaction. Uh, but most of the theory here doesn't really rely on being twice differentiable. And so you know, there, there are more things to be done in that vein. And the algorithm that I'm using in this picture uh, is this very classic proximal point method. Uh, the results here can extend to other algorithms, but for kind of the sake of, of convenience, this is the nicest algorithm. What we do is at each iteration, we add in a quadratic penalty that prevent each variable from moving very far. So in the x direction, we add in a quadratic centered at the current xk. And for y, we subtract a quadratic centered at yk. And if these penalties are large enough, then solving a minimax problem over this regularized objective won't move very far, and we'll get a small local update. And if eight is big enough here, this subproblem is much, much easier to solve than the whole problem. And so we're able to kind of tractably make these small increments of local improvement. Uh, so, you know, then a little bit on the assumptions that we'll need to, to kind of get our theory going. Uh, and first, I, I'll tell you what I don't assume. So the classic setting would be that you assume your objective is smooth. So it has a beta Lipschitz gradient and that your mu strongly convex and strongly concave, uh, which says that not only am I convex, but I curve up at least at rate mu. Is there a question? Okay. Uh, and so strong concavity is saying the same thing that we are not only concave, but we curve down at least at rate mu. So if you have these two conditions, very classic arguments show that you'll converge on that minimax problem with you know, almost any algorithm. Uh, but I don't want to make strong assumptions like that. And so instead, the only kind of structure that I'm going to impose is that we are row weakly convex and weakly concave. So that says that instead of guaranteeing I curve at least at some rate mu upwards, uh, I'm going to allow non-convexities as long as I don't curve downwards too fast. So my x hessian should be bounded below by this minus row identity, which amounts to being able to draw a quadratic underneath the objective at each point. So you can make very generic non-convex shapes, but you can never turn down sharply. So I can always fit a quadratic underneath it. Same thing with weak concavity. I want quadratic upper bounds that prevent me from too quickly being non-concave. So just bounding how quickly it can go wrong, uh, but letting you have uh, you know, a lot of freedom within that. And so the core kind of proof object that we need behind the scenes uh, is this uh, object that we introduced called the saddle envelope, uh, which is just looking at the objective that comes out of that minimax problem we solve at each iteration. So at some x, y, I add and subtract in these quadratics for the x and y variables, solve that minimax problem, whatever the objective uh, of the solution is, you know, put that in our saddle envelope uh, for x, y. If you ignore the maximization going on here, this is a very classic object called the Moreau envelope uh, that you know, shows up everywhere in convex optimization. Uh, but with minimax here, uh, we get some really different properties that show up from this. Uh, and so for the, the optimizers that are very familiar with Moreau envelopes, uh, there are some surprising differences uh, for how this works. But the kind of critical insights uh, about this object are that it, it one closely follows the original objective. So there's a tight relationship between them, which will kind of be critical for this being helpful as an analysis tool. Uh, point two is very much like the Moreau envelope. Uh, this ends up being a smoothing. So the saddle envelope is beta smooth, even though we're not assuming anything like that for the original objective. And the third point here uh, is maybe the most surprising. Uh, the saddle envelope can be convex and concave, even if the original objective isn't. Uh, and so there's nothing like that for the Moreau envelope. The, the classic kind of object, uh, in a sense, preserves convexity. So the very classic thing with just minimization is convex exactly when the original problem is convex. But here we can gain convexity and concavity, uh, which is going to be the key for all of our results. Uh, and so that's something very special that seems to only show up here. Uh, so you know, the saddle envelope convexifies. That's, uh, that's magical uh, to me. Uh, and so you know, simplifying our conditions to see what's happening. Uh, 
the saddle envelope will be convex and concave. Whenever these two conditions hold, the left one for convexity and the right one for concavity. And essentially what this is saying is that the interaction part of the Hessian needs to be big enough. So if the square matrix we make out of the XY derivatives uh, dominates whatever non-convexities we see in X, you know, so the negative of the XX Hessian, if that square matrix from interaction dominates those, the saddle envelope is convex. If we make the other square matrix from the YX derivatives, that needs to dominate the non-concavities that show up in Y. But under those conditions, the saddle envelope will be convex concave, even though we're not assuming that for the original problem. Then we'll be able to solve things on our proxy and understand the original function through that. Uh, the more general result uh, gives some exact conditions. So the saddle envelope is strongly convex exactly when this larger kind of sure complement comes out positive definite. And similarly, we're strongly concave when a asymmetric looking term comes out positive definite. And so you know, there's uh, not enough time to get into the details of, of where those come from, but uh, these are kind of the critical quantities for understanding how our algorithms work on these minimax problems. And so I'll, I'll give these a name. Uh, since it's really the interaction that's what makes this work for non-convex, non-concave problems, I'll say a problem is alpha interaction dominant when we get both of these conditions. Uh, great. So, so now we have kind of the tools we need to give this convergence picture that we're aiming at. Uh, and so first I want to tackle this interaction dominant setting on the right, uh, since we kind of have exactly the tool we need in hand. Uh, so for these interaction dominant problems, we were thinking that the XY part of the Hessian is very large. You know, in our example, that's it taking value 100. And so the theorem is that if we're alpha in interaction dominant, then the proximal point method, or uh, here I, I have a more general form. So if you allow us to do some averaging, so at each iteration, you just move a, a lambda fraction of the way to the proximal point. You could just set lambda equal one to get the original method. Uh, but to get some cleanest convergence statements, I've hard-coded a choice of eta and lambda. If you go to the paper, it works with any eta and lambda. Uh, so for these particular choices, we get linear convergence to a stationary point where the rate is exactly controlled by this ratio between rho and alpha. So rho was how non-convex and non-concave we could be. It bounded our bad curvature and alpha is how interaction dominant we are. So if you're less non-convex, we'll converge faster. And if you have more interaction, we'll converge faster. Uh, but it kind of just depends on those two quantities. Uh, but that gives us kind of this, this unexpected regime. You know, what, why are we getting convergence when we have a lot of interaction? Well, it's exactly because this saddle envelope behind the scenes becomes convex concave, and then there's structure there that you wouldn't see at face value. Uh, so flipping sides of the spectrum for interaction weak problems. Uh, so we're thinking that this off diagonal part of the Hessian has like value one. Well, if it had value zero, I know how to solve the problem. If there was no interaction between the variables, then I can just separate it. So I could think, okay, hold Y constant at some Y prime and find a local minimizer in X, hold X constant at some X prime, find a maximizer, well, and then x star, y star together will be a stationary point since the variables can't affect each other. Uh, so that, that would be perfect uh, if we had exactly zero interaction, but that fails if we have any interaction at all. And so I want to take that intuition, and the idea is to just initialize the proximal point method at the result of doing this process. So if, if we're nearly uh, zero interaction, then this will give us nearly a stationary point. And then I just need my algorithm to make corrections from there. And so, you know, as a, an example, going back to what we had before, I could do this initialization holding X and Y constant at the origin. So my initialization would be that well, both variables move over to be around two, but we're not saying there's no interaction. And so doing that movement will still skew the objective sum, just not as bad as before. And so the skewed objective will have these X and Y's no longer be stationary points, but they'll be nearly stationary. 
And before they had a really nice Hessian because they were local minimizers and maximizers. And they'll still have a pretty nice Hessian. Uh, it can only be changed so much if we don't have much interaction that can go wrong. And so we have nearly stationary, nearly good Hessians. Uh, and that ends up being enough. And so and what we can say is that hard coding the same values, uh, we'll get linear convergence to a stationary point out of this initialization whenever the interaction uh, part of our Hessian is sufficiently small. So I want it to be bounded in operator norm by delta and have a Lipschitz constant bounded by some small uh, uh, Cassis. And together, that's all we need. Uh, so I'm, I'm masking all the details for what this alpha naught is and what we need on these bounds. But if those are bounded to be small enough and you do this initialization, then you have nice local structure and will again converge. So that explains these four different local solutions that showed up uh, in our example. You know, the same kind of thing happens here. Uh, and then the last part of my picture uh, was this middle regime where we've already talked about it being hard. Uh, so, you know, our motivating example showed that in between these, we can have uh, cycling show up. So here we have a globally attractive cycle. Uh, if you initialize anywhere besides exactly the origin, the algorithm will fall into this cycle and never escape. Uh, and this is robust to perturbing the problem instance a little bit. Uh, so it's really you know, it's not some edge case phenomena. Uh, maybe even worse than cycling, uh, we can show in this middle case that there's divergence. So your algorithm might run off to infinity, uh, you know, despite there being a natural solution. And so you know, it's not even bad that we cycle, we might run away. Uh, and we can show diverging examples that have alpha interaction dominance for any non-positive alpha. So in our interaction dominant regime, I showed that if you have a positive alpha, then we can get a convergence rate. Uh, and so all the way up to and including that boundary, we can make diverging examples. Uh, and so really our, our characterization of that, that boundary is tight. Uh, and so we, we couldn't push and, and get a, a farther uh, guarantee than really what we have. Um, there's some limited theory that we can do in this setting uh, that I just fully defer to the paper, kind of bounding how quickly you can diverge and that kind of structure. But since diverging and cycling are possible, uh, limited is the key word there. You know, there's, there's kind of a fundamental barrier to how much you can guarantee when it's that bad. Uh, but overall, that gives us this picture for what happens in minimax optimization. Uh, if we have sufficiently little interaction, we get global, we get local convergence. In the middle, we can have cycling and bad behaviors, but if there's enough interaction, we get saved from that and we'll have global convergence. Uh, all of that to stationary points. Uh, so great, I think that's a, uh, a good stopping place for the abridged talk. Uh, any questions? All right, let's thanks Ben first before we take any questions here. So we have just a brief minute for questions. Um, I can uh, actually ask one question. So um, I noticed that, so in, so in minimax optimization, a lot of times you'll have constraints on the variables. Otherwise the objective function needs to be bounded below and above, right? Is there any extension to constraints? Uh, so uh, uh, yes, you can do very similar things to constraints. And so the, I think the best answer is kind of by, by metaphor. Uh, so since we're doing the proximal step, uh, you know, I, I hand waved that it's not really important for our theory that we're twice differentiable. Uh, that, that lets me point to the off diagonal part of the Hessian, but the structure of what this proc step does doesn't depend on differentiability. Uh, that's true in convex optimization and the same here. Uh, and so what you can do to handle that uh, is you know, take your constraints and add them into the objective as an indicator function. So when you solve this proximal subproblem, you're then solving that also over the constraints, uh, but you're going to have the same structural lemma show up. The proximal, the saddle envelope will still come out as a smoothing, even if you add in indicator functions to it, uh, just like convex optimization. You know, and so the same machinery can run through. Uh, you're just going to, you know, 
lose some of the ability to point to the Hessian. Uh, but you know, there, there's not a, a structural limitation to rolling those in. Okay. Great. Um, and then we'll have a question by Sid, but I just want to say for those of you who have to run, I know we're a bit over time, uh, feel free to drop uh, without social pressure and we'll give Sid a, Sid a chance to ask his question now. Like reverse social pressure. Okay, I'll make it short. Um, I mean, really nice talk. So one thought I had while looking at this was like this sort of concave convex condition generalizes to some extent to like multi-agent setting. So there's this general notion of what's called Rosen's criterion for when equilibria exist in multi-agent settings. And I wonder if you can do something similar that if there is some amount of sufficient interaction, then there's a more general constraint condition for equilibria, uniqueness, and existence in multi-agent settings? That is a, a, a good question. I haven't thought much about that. Uh, I it, it seems natural that, that something would generalize to that. Uh, my, my mindset so far has been a, a optimizer where it's nice to write a zero-sum game, uh, and multi-agent gets me out of my optimizer mindset. Uh, but yeah, you know, zero sum though, right? Zero sum minimax always holds. It doesn't even matter if it's convex concave. Um, just yeah, uh, but I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but that, that that would be an interesting direction. Because uh, it uh, the yeah that would be really cool. I mean, the, there are very few known results for showing multi-agent existence, except for like basically showing there's a potential function which is concave. Uh, a, a caveat that I somewhat slid under the rug here. Uh, the, the points we converge to are stationary points, you know, which is the first order Nash condition. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, from this kind of first order method, uh, I don't have any way to give a guarantee on higher moments. So we get the, the necessary condition for it being an equilibrium, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do find an equilibrium or it exists. Uh, so, you know, in the, in the full statement of wanting a, uh, an existence of equilibrium theorem uh, will fall a little bit short. At the least, I'll find a, a local equilibrium kind of point. Uh, you know, in some first oh, order sense, cool. or uh, so we're, we're going to be limited in that way of somewhat our algorithms are only thinking first order. Uh, yeah. I doubt I can prove something better than that. Okay. Um, that's actually also interesting. There is a notion of what's called a local Nash equilibrium. Which is actually much more recent, where right? people were thinking exactly of this. And, yeah, um, um, out of uh, okay. Michael Jordan's group, uh, they okay. they have uh, some work doing things along those lines. In both of these perspectives, I hand waved, either thinking about a a sequential game, you know, what is a local solution for the sequential game, or what's a local solution for the kind of simultaneous game, because those are different conditions. Yeah. Uh, cool. Thanks. Great. That's a great question. All right. So I guess we'll move further questions offline. Um, but before we go, let's thank Ben again for a great talk. And I'll see you soon. <laughs> awesome.